Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is Sunday where we're studying in our group learning program to share the teachings of the Buddha with you so that you can make progress along this path to enlightenment, where you can train the mind to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. And in order to do that, there's various teachings that you need to learn. There's a life practice that you need to develop. And having a kind of slow trickle of the teachings each week or each day is very helpful. So in this Facebook group, Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, and all the other places that we share content, I'm sharing resources to help you slowly learn the teachings of the Buddha and giving you a chance to connect with personal guidance. One of the things that we have as a cornerstone of this group learning program is this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. And each Sunday, we cover a chapter in this book. And then on Wednesday, we do meditation together or Buddhist chanting together. Today, we're in chapter 19, which is titled The Difficult Human Existence, Sickness, Aging, and Death. And in this chapter, I've shared some content to help you learn just a little bit of the Buddha's life story, as well as these four observations that he made, which ultimately motivated him to decide to go on this journey and actually attain enlightenment. And in this same chapter, I help with a little bit of guidance on how you can deal with these really challenging and difficult experiences that we have, which is sickness, aging, and death. Because in terms of being a human being, these are three of the most challenging things that we experience. When the physical body is sick, the mind sometimes is not well. Or when you're experiencing aging, the mind may not be well. Or when there's death or your own death and contemplating that, the mind may have difficulties with that. So today we're going to talk about the Buddha's life story and we're going to connect in these observations that the Buddha made and potentially even help you learn a bit about how to improve your condition of your mind as you experience sickness, aging, and death throughout this life. Now, everything that I share in this program and all the different resources that I share, I've basically have done the work in order to confirm that these are the Buddhist teachings and that what I'm sharing is 100% the truth. I've done that by, one, ensuring that everything that I teach is from the Pali Canon. The Pali Canon is the most complete, largest source of the teachings of the Buddha. And that's where we source our teachings from, is the Pali Canon. There's 45 volumes of books that we have access to that we can dive into and see what the Buddha actually taught. So I've explored that extensively and made sure that what I teach is based in the Pali Canon. I then didn't believe those teachings. I never believed anything that I read because in terms of the books and content that was sitting in front of me, there's a lot of impermanence from the time that the Buddha spoke until 2,500 years later. I didn't ever believe anything that I read. Instead, I investigated the teachings and reflected on them and then practiced them to see the effect that it had in my own mind and how the mind transformed as a way of learning and practicing these teachings. So the second thing I've done is I've investigated the teachings, reflected on those, and practiced those to observe the changes to the condition of my own mind. 
Then over the course of a few years here, I've been sharing these teachings with students and students as they learn are reporting that these teachings are working for them too. It's improving the condition of their mind and improving the condition of their life. They're observing that the mind is significantly diminishing its discontentedness and they're experiencing more and more results along the path. And then the fourth thing that I've done in order to confirm that what I share is the truth is that here in Thailand, there's certain times and occasions where I might be around Thai people and they know that I'm teaching the Buddhist teachings and they will ask me, you know, what is it that you teach for meditation or what is it that you teach for this topic or that topic? And then when I share it with them, they say, oh, that's really interesting because that's what we learn as well. When we study with enlightened monks who everyone in the community knows is an enlightened monk, when we study in Thai, you're teaching the exact same thing that they're teaching that we learn in Thai, you're just teaching it in English. So that's a confirmation for me that what I'm sharing is the truth. But it's these four things combined that gives me the confidence to know that indeed what is being shared is the truth, that it's sourced from the Pali Canon, it worked for me in my own life practice, it's working for the students, and Thai people confirm for me that it's the same thing that they're learning with their enlightened master monks. Now what I'm going to share with you today in regards to the life story of the Buddha, it doesn't meet those same criteria, okay? And I'm sharing this with you to help you understand that what I'm sharing with you in terms of the Buddha's life story is not something that anybody could ever either prove or disprove. There's a lot of different information in the world about what the Buddha's life was and certain things that he did. When I share with you the story of the Buddha, it might be very different than what you've heard, or there might be certain aspects of the story that's different than what you've heard. But from my observation, there's about 80 or 90% of these stories that seem to have commonality among all people. So what I'm sharing with you today is going to be essentially stories that have been handed down from generation to generation to generation. And there is some content in the Pali Canon about the Buddha's life. And I've read that and I've seen some of that. And I'll have some of that as part of what I'm sharing. But in reality, what is important is not that we know 100% of exactly what the Buddha's life was, his own personal life. What's important is that we understand his teachings and those we can independently confirm in those four ways that I talked about. We can confirm that those are the truth. What happened with the Buddha and his life story? You know, was he in the forest for six years or was he there for seven years? It doesn't really matter because it's in the past. What really matters is that we learn his teachings. So I'm just prefacing everything that I share with you today with helping you to understand that these are stories that I've heard and understood. And what I share in these classes in terms of his life story is what I see the commonality among all the different parts of the story. So I've probably heard five, 10 different stories about the Buddha's life story, but it's these commonalities that we see that those are what I tend to share in these classes. So as we go, I will stop and allow you guys to ask any questions that you have. You're welcome to put those into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. Our moderators will see that and be able to get your questions asked during the class. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you might have. And this way you can learn a bit about the Buddha's story. But more importantly, what I'm going to be doing in today's class is really extrapolating out of the story really good learning lessons of things that you can understand about his life story that are going to help you in your journey to enlightenment. Because like I said, whether the Buddha was in the forest for six years or seven years, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, you know, how can we take the Buddha's life story and apply it to our life? How can we extrapolate lessons learned in order to apply those to our life and get some benefit on this path to enlightenment? And that's what I'm planning to do for you today. So thank you all for joining. I appreciate that you've decided that you would like to learn the Buddhist teachings and understand more about this path to enlightenment and how to progress. Because as you do and you 
gradually, slowly train your own mind and improve your life practice, your life is going to get better. The life of the people close to you is going to get better. And all of humanity improves because individually we're focusing on our own life practice and no longer causing harm in the world through things like our intentions, our speech, our actions, our livelihood, and things like this. So thank you all for choosing to dedicate your time and effort today to learn and practice these teachings. So let's talk about the Buddha's life story and kind of discussing it in terms of his birth, his early life, his journey to enlightenment, and then his teaching career and kind of what he did in terms of teaching. The individual who ultimately became known as the Buddha or Gautama Buddha was born as Siddhartha Gautama. He was born into a royal family and he was born as the first born son of a king. So he was destined to become the king. He was a prince. And his mother and father, who were the king and the queen, as they had their relationship and the mom was pregnant and was about to deliver birth, in that period of time, when it was time for a woman to give birth, they would travel home to their home where they grew up in their parents' home in order to give birth to the child. So that's ultimately what the Buddha's mom does is that once she gets closer and closer to delivery, there's a caravan that's assembled, you know, a royal caravan, and it goes off trekking out to her homeland, to where she was brought up and where she was born. Along this journey, she goes into labor pains and she starts to actually give birth. So they stop the caravan. She gets out and she goes over under a tree and she reaches up and grabs the branch of a tree because she's in such intense pain with the baby trying to be born. As she's trying to give birth, the baby wouldn't come out in the natural birthing canal. So the baby ends up coming out of the side of her stomach. We might think of this as a C-section today, but during the lifetime of this period, 2,500 years ago, there weren't any uh, modern technology to do a C-section. So the baby essentially comes out of the side of the stomach. And because of this, seven days later, the Buddha's mom actually dies. She's not able to sustain her life because there wasn't the technology and understanding of how to fix this as there is today. At the time of the birth of Siddhartha Gautama, there's kind of a story about what happens at the time of his birth. And I will share that story with you because it's a common one that you hear, but I don't necessarily know that this is true or not. And it, and it really doesn't matter. I have a tendency to think that it's not true. And I'll explain to you why in a little bit. When the baby comes out from the side of his mom's stomach, it's said that he walks seven steps immediately walks from birth and as he's walking these seven steps there's lotus flowers that blossom under his feet and on the seventh step he declares in his own voice that this is going to be his last life and he will never be reborn again i don't know that that's true because i don't see that happening as a newborn child being able to walk or talk and these lotus flowers blossoming under the feet. And particularly, I don't know that that's true because the next part of the story wouldn't have needed to take place if that took place. The next part of the story is that Siddhartha Gautama's father, who's the king, summoned 108 advisors to come tell him what his son was going to become as part of his life because this was a common practice for royalty to bring in advisors and kind of almost like fortune tellers to kind of tell you what your son or your daughter is going to become. And 107 of these advisors shared with Siddhartha Gautama's father, the king, that his son was going to become a great leader, a great monarch. He was going to rule over the kingdom and expand his territory. Well, of course, Siddhartha Gautama's dad, the king's that's my boy. All right. But there was this one advisor who came in and essentially apologizing to the king and said, sir, it is true that your son is going to be a great leader, but not in the way that you think. He's not going to be a monarch. 
he's going to be a spiritual leader and he's going to help all of humanity through being a spiritual leader. Well, if that story took place, there would be no need to have these advisors come in and actually advise the king of what was happening. Because if you have a baby and they walk as soon as they come out of the womb and lotus flowers are blossoming under their feet and they can speak right away, I think it's pretty obvious what's going to be happening with this child. So I don't know that that story is correct. It could be kind of some embellishment along the way for the last 2,500 years. But nonetheless, Siddhartha Gautama's dad hears this one advisor and he doesn't like the fact that his son may potentially be a spiritual leader. He wants his son to be a monarch and expand his kingdom and rule over his kingdom. So his father decides to sequester Siddhartha Gautama in the palace, not allowing him to go outside and see the problems in the world because he felt that if Siddhartha Gautama saw the problems that existed in the world, then as a potential spiritual leader, he would want to figure this out and kind of solve these. So he sequesters his son in the palace and he basically gives him all the royal riches and wonderful clothing, wonderful food, beautiful women bathing him, all the best things that you can imagine that a royal family would have. This was kind of the way to woo him into the ways of becoming a monarch and without his dad actually kind of knowing it, kind of get him attached to all this desire, all this sensual pleasures of being a prince and potentially being a king. So for 29 years, Siddhartha Gautama lives this life of luxury. He does actually marry uh, during that time. He marries one of his cousins and he has a baby. But then at the age of 29, something significant happens. He's about to become the king because during this time frame, you didn't become the king when your father died. You become the king when you reach the age of 30. And at the age of 29, Siddhartha Gautama realizes that he's about to become the king and he's never actually been outside the palace. So how could he rule over this kingdom without ever knowing the trials and tribulations of the people in the population. So without his father's knowledge, Siddhartha Gautama enlists the help of his attendant to take him outside the palace to observe and see what's going on out in the kingdom. And when he goes outside the kingdom, he has what we call the four observations, four observations that really change the way Siddhartha Gautama looks at the world. He sees a sick person. He sees an aging or elderly and old person. He sees a dead corpse and he sees an aesthetic or a spiritual seeker, someone who's given up the material world and looking for answers in the world. And these four observations really are profound to Siddhartha Gautama because he didn't understand these aspects of life because He was so sheltered in the palace that he wasn't aware of these things that existed in the world. So when he observed the sick person, he had to ask his attendant, you know, what is that? What's going on over there? Because he saw that the person themselves who was sick was highly discontent and the people around them were discontent as well, which we now talk about as discontentedness. And his attendant explains to him that this is a sick person. And then when he sees the aging or elderly, the old person, the body's very decrepit and a lot of pain and misery, Siddhartha Gautama has to ask his attendant, you know, what is that? He's like, oh, that's an old person. When you age and you get older, you're not going to have this youthfulness anymore and the body ages. And Siddhartha Gautama saw the discontentedness associated with the person getting old and then the people around them as well. And then he sees a corpse, a dead body, and he asks his attendant, you know, what is that? And he's like, that's what happens to us as we age, we end up actually dying and the physical body deteriorates. And of course, around the dead body were family members and people who were very, very discontent because of this. And then Siddhartha Gautama sees this aesthetic or this person who's given up worldly possessions, this spiritual seeker. And he says, you know, what is that? 
and his attendant says, oh, that person's trying to understand the world and find the answers to solve certain problems with the mind and with this life. And this really was a profound experience for Siddhartha Gautama because up until that time, he had not seen the despair and the misery that existed in the kingdom because in his palace, he was living this life of luxury. And when he goes back, he doesn't see a way for him to actually become the king and rule over this misery. He didn't feel that that was the way that he needed to help people in the world. And he didn't feel that he was going to be of a big help to the world. So he decides to go off and try to figure out the answer to these problems of why there's this sickness, aging, and death, why the mind is so discontent during that period of time. And he goes off leaving the royal palace. He leaves his wife and his child behind. It's said that he left in the middle of the night because he didn't understand craving, desire, attachment at this point. He's just at heart to go to him. He's an unenlightened being. But he knew enough that if he told his wife he was leaving and he kissed her goodbye or you know commiserated with her and his child who was an infant at the time, he felt like the pull, it would be too much of a struggle and too difficult for him to leave. So he decides to leave in the middle of the night where he can kind of slip out and not really have this tug and this pull towards staying. But at this point, he still doesn't understand craving, desire, attachment. So when he leaves the palace, he takes with him his favorite horse and he takes his attendant with him because he still has these attachments, right? And he leaves the palace and at some point he sits down and he cuts off his hair. During this time frame, the way that people knew who the royal family was was by their hair. There wasn't social media, there wasn't pictures, there wasn't broadcasting, you know, the image of a certain person to let the villagers and common people know who the royal family was. But the way people knew that you were part of the royal family is by your hair. And even for men in the royal family, they would grow their hair very, very long. And it's only people in the royal family that would be able to have this long, beautiful, flowing hair. Because if you were a laborer or you were like a merchant that was working really hard, you would be hot, you would be sweaty, you would be spending a lot of time to take care of all these tasks in order to conduct your life. You wouldn't have the ability to take care of this long, beautiful hair, which a member of the royal family would have these servants that would be taking care of their hair and they would have the time to sit around and do that. But, you know, commoners, you know, we would have our hair kind of in disarray in some cases because we don't take the time to take care of it. But the royal family would have that time. By Siddhartha Gautama sitting down and cutting off his hair, this hair that he had grown for 29 years, this is essentially a way of saying, I'm not going back. Because there's no way that anyone in the kingdom would ever believe that he was the king without that long hair that he had grown for so many years and cultivated and taken care of. So he made the decision that I'm not going back to the palace and he cut off his hair. He sends his attendant and the horse away and he ends up taking on training with two teachers. There's one teacher that he studies with and in a very short period of time, he becomes an expert on this teacher's teachings. And he can teach this person's teachings as a teacher. That particular teacher made him a teacher in their discipline. And that particular teacher claimed that it was his teachings that led to enlightenment. And when Siddhartha Gautama learned those teachings and became acknowledged as a teacher in that discipline, Siddhartha Gautama said those teachings didn't lead to a peaceful mind because his mind was still discontent, even though he became elevated as a teacher. So then he took up training with another teacher and learned that teacher's teachings all the way to the point where they acknowledged him as a teacher in that discipline. And once again, Siddhartha Gautama noted that even though he had been acknowledged as a teacher and had mastered this person's teachings, the mind was still discontent. Primarily what they were doing in those two places and other camps that were claiming to have discovered the teachings to attain enlightenment is they were disparaging the human body. 
the thought was that if you inflicted pain to the human body, that the body would be in such pain that the mind would have to have to transcend that pain. And that's how the mind got to enlightenment. So people would hang themselves upside down from trees. They would pierce the skin with various implements and inflicting this pain on the physical body. They would actually starve the body, uh, not eating very much, uh, if anything at all. And this was thought that it was going to lead to enlightenment by causing this pain to the physical body. But through Siddhartha Gautama becoming a teacher in both of these two disciplines, he said that it didn't lead to enlightenment. So eventually, realizing after two years of study with two different teachers that he was no better off than he was when he left the palace, he decides to trek out on his own and goes into the forest. And while he goes into the forest, he essentially continues to do what he was doing with these other teachers. He starved himself. He was on the brink of death at one point in the forest by himself. You may have seen artwork or statues about this. If you ever see artwork where the Buddha is in meditation and the abdomen is sunk in, the ribs are shown, the facial bones are being shown and very skinny and very depleted. This is depicting that time when he was in the forest, not eating. And the thought was that by doing that, the mind would eventually transcend this pain and attain enlightenment. But as he was on the brink of death, there was a little girl and her mom that observes this aesthetic that is in this depleted state and offers him some rice. And he reluctantly decides to eat the rice. Some artwork, you'll see him kind of turning his head away and kind of reaching out to the rice and kind of reluctantly accepting the rice. But what he realized in that moment, which really transformed his practice and really helped him turn the corner, is that he realized that if he allowed the physical body to die, then the mind wouldn't reside in this existence and he wouldn't be able to continue his training. So he reluctantly decided to accept this food and nourish the body. And that's where his practice really started to evolve. So he spent a total of six years on this journey to enlightenment, two years of it with other teachers that didn't lead to enlightenment. But then those four years in the forest by himself is where he really makes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of progress. And eventually having realized that he attained enlightenment because an enlightened mind is very obvious when the mind is enlightened because it's completely peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing any discontentedness. At that point, when he emerges from the forest, he has attained enlightenment on his own, which is one of the first criteria to being a Buddha, is to be able to attain enlightenment on your own without the assistance of any teachers. So even though he had studied for two years with teachers, those teachings didn't lead to enlightenment. It was only when he dedicated time and effort and energy on his own and his own independent journey that he discovered the teachings. And this is where a Buddha's wisdom is so deep and so profound. Because when you study with those teachers, the Buddha just did what they said and he observed that his mind didn't get to enlightenment. But for someone who's studying on their own, like the Buddha did, if they try to do something and it's not working, they're going to discard it. And if something is working, then they know that it's improving the condition of their mind, so they will keep doing that. So by the time an individual who's going to become a Buddha actually attains enlightenment, the only thing that they have in their mind is the wisdom that leads to enlightenment. They've discarded everything else because they know it didn't work. So they're independently working through all these various things in order to discover what is it that truly leads to enlightenment. And once he discovered that, he emerges out of the forest and he goes back to the area where he originally started studying with those two teachers because he had friends in those areas. As he comes back into those areas, those students were still disparaging the body. They were still hanging themselves upside down from trees. They were still starving themselves. And here they see the aesthetic Gautama, monk Gautama, coming down the street with all the meat on his bones and 
looking nourished, which was very odd to them because to them, you had to be essentially malnourished in order to get to enlightenment. So they were laughing and joking and mocking him because they thought that he had given up and that he had kind of gone back to the royal palace and back to his royal life. But he hadn't actually given up. He had actually attained enlightenment, but he had discovered this middle way that disparaging the body and putting yourself into this torture, essentially, wasn't the way to attain enlightenment. But also being complacent or lazy isn't the way to attain enlightenment either. So he found this middle way that he eventually ends up teaching. But when he comes back into the area where these people are, they were laughing, they were joking, and he said that he had attained enlightenment. And they didn't think that he had actually attained enlightenment. And the Buddha kind of foresaw this because after he emerged from the forest, he hung out around this tree for seven weeks, essentially contemplating whether or not he was going to teach or not because he knew that he had discovered the teachings that lead to enlightenment. But he didn't think that the world was ready to hear what it is that he had to say because his teachings were so different so vastly different than what everyone else was doing at that time. Here, he had discovered this middle way, but yet people were holding on to disparaging the human body. So it took him about seven weeks to finally be convinced that, okay, I'm going to share these teachings with the world. And just as he thought, when he came back in contact with people, they weren't really interested at first because They thought that he was not really doing what he needed to do to attain enlightenment. They didn't think there was any way that he had attained enlightenment because he was too nourished. He had meat on his bones. So he ends up sitting down and he touches his hand to the earth. And then all these animals start coming towards him. Essentially, he performed a miracle where touching the earth called all these animals to come testify on his behalf that he had attained enlightenment. When that happened, the first five students decide to sit down and learn with him. One of them was one of his previous teachers. He sat down to learn with him. And then four other of his co-students came and sat down. This is the first five students where he delivers his talk on the Four Noble Truths. This is the beginning of the path to enlightenment where someone can break through to establishing right view. While these people were disparaging the body, thinking that causing pain to the physical body is what was going to train the mind, here comes the Buddha explaining the Four Noble Truths about how there's this problem of discontentedness in the mind. The cause of that problem is craving, desire, attachment, the mind craving permanence when there's this universal truth of impermanence. The way to eliminate the discontent mind is to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. And then the way forward or the path leading to the complete elimination of discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. So in four very clear and simple statements, he lays out for them exactly what the problem is, the cause of the problem, the solution to the problem, and the complete solution, which is the Eightfold Path. And from that point forward, those five students decided to continue to learn and study with the Buddha. And he ends up teaching for 45 years, sharing these teachings for his entire life. Eventually, his wife, his son, his mother, who essentially his biological mother's sister, adopted him and became the stepmother. So his aunt was like the stepmother. They actually all joined him on this journey to enlightenment. He even had cousins and brothers and people like this that came out of the royal family in order to join him on this path to enlightenment. All the way to the point where his father comes to him in misery, crying and upset, highly discontent because the royal family is starting to diminish. And his father was concerned that the royal family wouldn't be able to continue. So the Buddha implements a approach that any time somebody would like to ordain with him, they would have to have the approval of their parents. And if they have life partner, like a wife or a husband 
or children that they would need to give approval for them to come out of the home because the Buddha realized that his teachings were having such an impact in society that more and more people were coming out of the homes and he wasn't interested in collapsing society. So he ensured that the people who were in your life were agreeing that you could come and ordain with him and give that acknowledgement and kind of let go. And this training guidance is still around today. So here in Thailand, if you decide to ordain at the ordination, your parents and your life partner, if you have children, they are the first ones to cut the hair off the head and as an acknowledgement of their support that yes, we're comfortable with you going to become ordained because a child leaving the home or a parent leaving the home, mother, dad, brother, sister, this can put a strain on the other family members. So the Buddha was interested in making sure the other people in the household were accepting and willing to let go of this person to go on their journey to enlightenment. So over 45 years of teaching, everything that he shared was in the oral tradition. He taught orally. Nothing was written down during his lifetime. But as people learn the teachings that lead to enlightenment, the mind becomes more clear. It becomes focused. It becomes concentrated. It becomes very crisp. The mind develops this ability to memorize in very profound ways. So as he was teaching and his students' mind were becoming more and more enlightened, they were able to remember his teachings word for word for word. During his life, not only was he teaching, but then his students would go out and teach as well. And once he dies, there's this large group of enlightened beings, countless beings who had attained enlightenment that remembered and retained his teachings word for word for word. And then at some point after his death, they decide to actually write down the teachings so that they can be preserved and handed down for multiple generations. And that's what we've got in what we call the Pali Canon or the Pali Text. These are the preserved teachings that have been handed down from generation to generation from the lifetime of the Buddha when he spoke the words orally to his students being able to remember them. They produced enlightenment for them as well. And then they preserve the teachings because one of the things that once you attain enlightenment and you see the condition of the mind is improving, the last thing you're interested in doing is changing the teachings or the last thing you should be interested in doing is changing the teachings. Because if this Buddha has taught people and their mind became enlightened, it's like night and day between being unenlightened to enlightened. And that's a gradual progress to get to that point. But once you attain enlightenment and you know the peacefulness of the enlightened mental state, you would be interested in other people experiencing that if they choose to learn. So his enlightened students weren't interested in changing his teachings because they knew the truth. They knew what led to enlightenment and their interest was to preserve it for future generations. So we have 45 volumes of books that create what we call the Pali Canon as the source teachings. And it's called Pali because the language that it's written in is Pali. But Pali is no longer a spoken language today. And at one time, we thought that the Buddha probably spoke in Pali. But now there's been some new discoveries in the last few years that scholars and historians and archaeologists have uncovered some other texts that were in a language prior to Pali. So most likely the Buddha actually didn't speak in Pali, but what we actually have access to is the Pali Canon. And now over the last several decades, there's been people who speak English that have learned Pali and translated the Pali text into English. And there are people along the path that spoke Thai or Vietnamese or other languages and they translated the Pali canon into their localized language. And that's part of what we have in our Pali canon in English study group, which meets on Saturdays in the same place where we have the Buddhist teachings in English, but they relate back to his original oral discourses that were remembered for his entire lifetime and afterwards until they were eventually written down. Then once he dies, 
there's countless more people who attain enlightenment after his death. And even now, today, 2,500 years later, there's still people that are attaining enlightenment based on his teachings. So these are the three criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha. Is one, they attain enlightenment on their own without any support or any access to any teachers whatsoever. That's what Siddhartha Gautama did. He went out in the forest completely by himself. Second, they're going to dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their teachings. And over the course of the rest of their life, there's going to be countless individuals who end up attaining enlightenment during the lifetime of that person as they share their independently discovered teachings with countless people during their lifetime. Then they're going to leave the teachings in such a condition that after their death, their teachings continue in the world and lead to the enlightenment of countless more people. So those are the three primary criteria is independently attain enlightenment, guided countless people to enlightenment during his lifetime, and left the teachings in such a condition that countless more people attain enlightenment after his death. And that's how we know that he was a Buddha. Now, a person who ultimately becomes a Buddha they don't set out to become a Buddha. Essentially, that experience that the Buddha had, those four observations, essentially puts an individual's mind into a tailspin. Their mind becomes so discontent. It's like, whoa, boom. It's almost like somebody set off a bomb inside the person's mind. And they don't get a reprieve from their discontent mind. It's only through learning and practicing and independently discovering the teachings that their mind starts to slowly, gradually improve and they can see the truth for themselves that the condition of their mind is improving. So the Buddha didn't set off to become a Buddha. He set off to solve this discontent mind that he didn't have any reprieve from over this six-year journey. And it was only through this six-year journey of gradually discovering what works to train the mind and get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy that he ultimately attains enlightenment and he realizes at that point that he's a Buddha and he's discovered the teachings because he knew what his mind was like from that time that bomb went off essentially in the mind, seeing those four observations, not having a reprieve for all those years. As his mind was slowly progressing, he could see that for himself and then he realized that he's the one who discovered the teachings and it was up to him to share these with humanity. A Buddha isn't interested in fame and fortune and material gain. They're not interested in becoming notable. They're interested in just helping others who choose to learn and choose to practice and essentially helping humanity. They're not interested in fame, fortune and notoriety. So while today we know the Buddha is very famous around the entire world, during his lifetime, he was just an average man, just like everyone else, other than the fact that he was very peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, other than the fact that he was deeply wise and had all this wisdom. But looking at an individual who's enlightened, there's no outward indication that this person is enlightened in terms of their physical features. So while the Buddha knew he had attained enlightenment and the Buddha knew that he was a Buddha and the people who were studying with him knew that the condition of their mind was improving. So those people knew that he was enlightened and some of them probably knew that he was a Buddha, but not everybody around him and in, in that region of the world knew that he was a Buddha and were convinced that he was a Buddha. Because during his lifetime, there were other camps that were claiming that it was their teachings that led to enlightenment. And there were even Brahmin priests who were doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, worship, in order to convince the local people that they had to pay them money in order to, for them to pray to God. They had convinced the local population that they couldn't pray on their own. They had to pay these priests in order to pray on their behalf. And when the Buddha saw this, his teachings were very different than what the Brahmin priests were teaching and very different than what these other camps were teaching. So it was often that the Buddha came in contact with other people and they would have discussions. And 
one particular teacher would be claiming that it was their teachings that led to enlightenment and they would bring their students together with the buddha and his students and they would discuss in some cases that teacher would get angry and frustrated and irritated and they would get up and leave and that's how people knew that that teacher wasn't enlightened and oftentimes those students would then become students of the buddha or other times the buddha would discuss his teachings so eloquently that that particular teacher then agreed that the Buddha was enlightened and that teacher wasn't. And he would then become a student of the Buddhas, bringing his students with him. And this is the way that the population of students grew and grew and grew is through observation of the Buddha's teaching and being able to independently confirm for themselves that the condition of their mind was improving. They could see the truth that through learning and practicing this teacher's teachings, that the condition of their mind was gradually improving. So they knew that this person was sharing the truth. But there were several people that didn't agree that this person was enlightened or that he was a Buddha. It wasn't until after he died that now we all consider him a Buddha because we see those three criteria that he attained enlightenment by himself, he taught his entire life, led countless people to enlightenment, and after his death, countless more people attained enlightenment. And this is how we know that he was a Buddha and all those other teachings essentially didn't survive because they didn't work for all those other teachers that were teaching around his lifetime. This sickness, aging, and death that the Buddha observed prior to going off on this journey to enlightenment this was the motivating factors that essentially put his mind into this tailspin in order to decide to work on this journey to attain enlightenment. So while the Buddha was attempting to solve the discontent mind, he actually discovered what causes such discontentedness around sickness, aging, and death. He realized that the reason why people are so discontent when they're sickness is because they're not comfortable with the impermanence of the physical body, that they're craving permanence, and that the physical body is going to be unhealthy sometimes. It can't be permanently healthy. And he realized that this aging, this was a craving for youthfulness, and that people had a desire for their youthful appearance or the movements of their body, was very fluid and very easy in their youth. And as they got older, there were aches and pains and the mind wasn't comfortable with this impermanence. And then with death, the mind's craving existence in this world or craving for people close to you to exist in the world permanently. So while he solved his own discontent mind, he actually solved this problem of sickness, aging and death, realizing that it's craving, desire, attachment for permanence, wanting things to be permanent, that actually is causing the mind to be discontent. So while he understood discontentedness, he also went beyond that and he understood how to solve this problem permanently, essentially. Because once a person attains enlightenment and they've eliminated discontentedness, they're no longer going to be reborn. Because the reason why we experience sickness, aging, and death is because we were born. If we weren't born, we wouldn't be experiencing sickness, aging, and death in this misery. What's causing the mind to be discontent is craving desire, attachment, craving permanence. But it's because we haven't gained the wisdom that we need in order to stop this whole cycle of rebirth and escape it, that we keep experiencing existence after existence after existence. And because we keep being reborn, we keep experiencing sickness, aging, and death over and over and over and over again. So not only did he solve the discontent mind, not only did he solve the problem of sickness, aging, and death and why people are so discontent, he actually solved the problem of how to eliminate this for good, which is as you attain enlightenment, there's no longer going to be any rebirth. And you'll know this is true, that as your mind becomes more and more content, more and more peaceful, and you see that for yourself, that the condition of the mind is improving, you may actually end up experiencing past lives and observing past lives. Some people do, some people don't. 
if you attain enlightenment and you haven't observed your past lives, well, you're still going to know that you've attained enlightenment because your mind is so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. And you can know that you will no longer experience any kind of despair, any more misery, because you've transcended all that sorrow, all that grief, all that despair in this life. And you know, even if you haven't seen your past lives, that the teachings of the Buddha led exactly where he said they would, to a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, a stable, steady, calm mind that is unshakable. And when you experience that liberation of mind gradually over time, even if you haven't seen your past lives, you will know that you're no longer ever going to be reborn to experience sorrow, grief, misery, and despair ever again because you've transcended that in this life. So therefore, you're not going to be reborn to experience that ever again. So this is a bit about the story of the Buddha and connecting it to our practice on the path to enlightenment. I'll just pause here and see what questions you guys have for the rest of our class. The way that you can ask questions is in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Just put those into the comment section so that our moderators can see that. And then in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and our moderators will call on you in order to ask any question or follow-up questions that you have. Hello, teacher. We have a question from my holding. She asks, is it possible that uh, his first teachers gave him some insight to the teachings he discovered, or was that he discovered really completely on his own? The teachings that ultimately led to enlightenment, he discovered on his own. But what he did learn from those first two teachers is he learned a little bit about meditation. So he learned a little bit about meditation and the idea of Kama in the teachings of the natural law of Kama already existed in Hinduism. So as he grew up in this kingdom, which he grew up in Nepal, that's where he was born and raised. So the region of the world that we call Nepal is where he actually was born. But that line of Nepal and India didn't exist during his lifetime. So he basically roamed around Nepal in northeastern India. And in that region of the world, there was already kind of this idea of Gamma. But he didn't really deeply understand it with those first two teachers. And he didn't understand all the teachings that led to enlightenment. And he just learned a little bit about meditation. So it wasn't until he went out on his own that he deeply understood the teachings. And then once he did, he shared it with everybody. One of the things that you will hear people say in some communities is they will say, ah, you don't need a teacher. You can attain enlightenment on your own, just like the Buddha did. The Buddha attained enlightenment on his own, so you can do it too. Well, that's not correct. The reason why he's a Buddha is because he attained enlightenment on his own. Everyone else needs teachers. A Buddha is going to be able to attain enlightenment on their own, but everyone else is going to need teachers. That's why he spent 45 years sharing the teachings. He didn't come out of the forest and say, I attained enlightenment on my own. You guys can too. Go ahead and go do it. I'm going back to my royal life. He didn't do that. He dedicated 45 years of teaching because he knew that other people needed teachers to be guided on this path. So he was a Buddha and he existed over 2,500 years ago and the world is unaware of any Buddha since his lifetime. So if you ever hear somebody say the Buddha attained enlightenment on his own, so therefore you can too, it's not true. That's one of the main criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha is that he was able to go off on his own and discover the teachings to attain enlightenment. And it was that four observations that threw his mind into that tailspin that ultimately led to his enlightenment because that discontent mind without a reprieve that he just had one goal in mind which was to attain enlightenment and eliminate this discontent mind he didn't really care how he did it whether it was with somebody else or his own he tried to do it with other people first but when they couldn't help him that's when he decided to go off and do it on his own so he wasn't attempting to become a buddha He was attempting to solve this discontent mind and he was willing to do that however he could. 
But when he realized that these other teachings didn't lead to enlightenment, he had no other choice but to go do it on his own. There's other criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha. One of them is a Buddha's mind doesn't function in exactly the same way as a average normal person. It functions in terms of craving anger and ignorance and all these teachings, it functions the same. But a Buddha's mind has a deep, profound memory. The average person, their mind is like a hard drive that gets overwritten continuously. So you might have a recall of a few kind of tidbits from your childhood about what happened in your childhood. But the main part of your memory is kind of over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. The childhood, it's very foggy and you just kind of remember a couple little brief things here and there. But a person who is ultimately going to become a Buddha, they have a deep, profound memory even before becoming enlightened. They have a really deep memory. Their mind doesn't get overwritten. Their mind accumulates all these memories because it's over the course of multiple lives that they learn and practice to ultimately become a Buddha. And during their last life where they ultimately become a Buddha, their mind has accumulated certain wisdoms from previous lives and their mind is accumulating certain wisdom from this life that ultimately leads to their enlightenment. As a person who is about to become a Buddha, his mind would have been highly discontent because of this profound memory that he had. He was remembering all these things from his life and previous lives too that would have threw his mind into a tailspin and he wouldn't have been getting a reprieve from that. So the quality of mind that having this deep profound memory that doesn't get overwritten is what kind of throws the individual into going off on this journey to attain enlightenment. So that quality of mind that is kind of the detriment that kind of throws them into this non-reprieve of being able to not experience peacefulness until they attain enlightenment, that same aspect of their mind, that same quality of mind is what ultimately benefits them once they become a Buddha. So during his lifetime prior to being a Buddha, he would have all these memories of all these different things, more so than any other average person. And that made his mind more and more and more and more discontent because he could remember all these things. But then once he attained enlightenment and he cleared his mind out, now he has such deep, profound memory that he can deeply remember the teachings and have profound wisdom of what it takes to lead to enlightenment. And he can remember his students. He can remember all the different aspects of their life. He can remember their practice. So this aspect of the mind that essentially throws them into this massive amount of discontentedness that ultimately leads to him becoming a Buddha, while it was a detriment in the past, it ultimately becomes an asset once he attains enlightenment and then shares the teachings with the world he uses that deep, profound memory to actually help his students with the teachings that lead to enlightenment. Well, the uh, next question is from Ali. She asks, I thought there are enlightened beings reborn to help others, like the Tibetan Lama. This isn't true. This is something that people have come up with after the Buddha. The way that all of this works is that once you attain enlightenment, the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. An enlightened being is not going to be reborn. So there's no such thing as being enlightened and then being reborn. So if you're hearing this kind of thing, it's not true. This is part of the challenge in the world is that there's this impermanence, right? That things don't stay fixed or stay permanent. So that's why there's so many different perspectives on the teachings around the world of different people learning and practicing different things because of impermanence. But by going back to the original teachings of the Buddha sourced in the Pali Canon, you can see the truth for yourself. What did the Buddha actually teach? So that's why in this book series, the words of the Buddha, I have 13 volumes of books that are sharing the teachings of the Buddha in his own words. So you can see that he talks about eliminating the cycle of rebirth as part of attaining enlightenment. There's many teachings where he shares this as part of his teaching. So that's why the Buddha never said, 
okay, I've attained enlightenment, and now I'm going to come back and help you guys in a future life. He never said that. But instead, when you look at his teachings in his own words, he's constantly referring to elimination of existence in the cycle of rebirth. So that's the real truth of what happens once someone attains enlightenment is that they're no longer a reborn in the cycle of rebirth. But once an enlightened being attains enlightenment and what happens next, the Buddha left this as an undeclared teaching. So we know if you don't attain enlightenment, you're going to be reborn in the cycle of rebirth. But you can also see in his own words that he talks about himself and he says, He's leaving it as an undeclared teaching of what happens to him after he dies. He didn't say whether he exists or whether he doesn't exist after death. Also, you'll find it even in volume one. We have this in volume one in chapters. Well, you'll find it. I know it's in chapter eight. I know we have it in there and it's at the end of the book as well. But if you read this book, you'll see all the teachings that you need and on this path to enlightenment. And it in- involves attaining enlightenment so you're no longer reborn and you can eliminate this sickness, aging, and death because it's birth that is creating this continuous cycle of sickness, aging, and death. And this is also why the Buddha referred to once you attain enlightenment, he referred to it as the deathless, meaning that you'll no longer be reborn again. But you'll see this in the books and in the teachings if you investigate them closely. Well, uh, Miranda has a question, so let's go to her. Hello, David. Um, I think it's more of a maybe two or three part question. Um, it's said that Gautama Buddha, when he was living in the palace, he never witnessed aging or sickness. So was he never sick himself as a child, and he never witnessed anyone in the palace, his father or any other relatives, um, aging? Or was it just the severity of it that he witnessed when he went outside the palace walls, seeing the sick person and the elderly person um, that had that profound of an impact on his mind. Yeah, that's the question that sometimes comes up is that, you know, how could he have existed for 29 years and never experienced sickness, aging and death? And the answer is we truly don't know. You know, some people say that that was the first time he'd ever seen sickness, aging and death. Other people say that it's the first time that he observed the significant discontentedness related to these things. There's different versions of that. And that's where I kind of prefaced the talk today saying, honestly, that part of the story doesn't really matter too much. What really matters is what did he actually teach and what leads to enlightenment? And when we focus on that, that's what's going to lead to our own peacefulness, our own enlightened mind. But you'll hear these different takes on what were the actual four observations? Some people will say that he had the four observations all at one time. Other people will say that he made four separate journeys out of the palace in order to see those four observations. So you hear these differences because of impermanence in the story. But that's why I prefaced with what I shared at the beginning of the class so you guys know that there's these differences out there. Okay, so that's just something that really isn't really known yeah, Sir, right. I don't know that we'll ever know that. I've read some of the story in the Pali Canon about the Buddha's life. And even in the Pali Canon, they put in there that he walked and talked and there was lotus flowers under his feet. But I think even that was probably an embellishment. You know, I don't know because I wasn't there. Uh, and, and in reality, it doesn't really matter uh, if he walked or if he talked or if he had lotus flowers. I know with 100 percent certainty that his teachings lead exactly where he said they would, to this stable, steady, content, and peaceful mind. I know that 100% certainty. And that's why I focus on teaching that as part of this path. And that's why I also wait until much later in the book to introduce any life story of the Buddha, because his life story, while it's interesting, while we would like to know as much as we can know about this person, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter truly. And I think the Buddha would say the same thing, that his life story doesn't matter. All that he's really truly interested in is people learning and practicing his teachings, because this is the very best thing that we could ever do for ourselves, those close to us, and all of humanity. So the best way to respect a teacher 
is to learn and practice their teachings and experience the results of those teachings. So I don't think he is really interested in people knowing his life story or, or having any significance of that. So that's why I put it so far deep in the book and focused the vast majority of what I share on what are the actual teachings rather than his life story. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. We have a question from Joshua. He asks, hello, teacher David. I have observed that you have a good memory. For example, recalling past conversations with students. Is this a quality that everyone who develops their life practice will eventually achieve as a result of, or is this simply a personal quality of yours? Uh, there's both of those things that are going to happen. For anyone who attains enlightenment, as you progress, your mind will become more focused, more clear. You'll have a more profound memory for everybody who attains enlightenment will experience that because carrying around craving anger and ignorance in the mind clutters the mind. It's a real burden to carry this around. And if you can ever think about times where you've been angry or frustrated or irritated, then you know that during those times, it's like you, you've lost all control of the mind and it's just like a big blur, everything, right? You've been yelling and screaming or throwing things or whatever. I don't know if you do that, but I used to in the past. <laughs> so I remember those days where the mind was just a big mush, you know, carrying around all that craving, anger and ignorance, all that pollution, all that defilement in the mind that burdens the mind and inhibits it from performing optimally. Because this middle way that the Buddha taught of bringing the mind to the middle, it's the middle way. So bringing the mind to the middle is going to perform optimally, just like that instrument that if it's out of tune, if the string is too loose, it's not going to perform well. If the string is too tight, it's not going to perform well. It's only when it's tuned perfectly in the middle that the instrument will perform well. And your mind is exactly the same way, that if you're holding on to things too tightly with craving, desire, attachment, the mind's carrying around this burden. It's muddled. So as any being attains enlightenment, they are going to experience more profound memory, more clarity of mind, and deep focus. And this is where the enlightened mind really benefits you. In your personal life, in your professional life, you will be able to use this really refined and optimized mind in order to help you in your life. So that's with every enlightened being. For the memory that I have, I have a lot of clarity. I have deep memory, but there's also some different aspects of the mind that I have that I'm not interested in going into today. But yes, I have the ability to recall countless details about this existence in the past and past existences as well. But not everybody's going to get that same quality of mind. But every enlightened being will experience deep, profound memory as part of this path. And it's from clearing out the pollution and bringing the mind to the middle that's going to produce that. Well, I'm interested to ask about a, uh, when the Buddha met uh, these uh, sick, old, and dead, dead men. A, uh, his journey was observing discontentedness and seeking escape from this discontentedness didn't start exactly at this point, right? I mean, he started observing this discontentedness in his mind from earlier years, right? Yeah, so a person who's ultimately going to become a Buddha, they would have been experiencing discontentedness throughout their life. So those first 29 years, Siddhartha Gautama would have been experiencing discontentedness, but he was just in his life doing the normal things that we all do as human beings. And along that path, by the way, along those 29 years, he would have been cluing into certain things without even thinking about enlightenment or even knowing that the path to enlightenment existed. He would have been exposed to certain things that his mind would have been remembering that ultimately helped him later. So for example, during his lifetime, it's said that he had a lot of passion and he had a very high sex drive with his wife. There's stories that during the courting part of their relationship that him and his wife were on the roof of a house or a roof of a building having deep, intense, passionate sex. And in the middle of that, they actually 
were so enthralled with each other and so deeply involved in sex that they come tumbling down off the roof, they hit the ground, and they continue to have sex because he's so passionate and into having sex with his wife. Well, that experience would have ultimately helped him to understand later when he was on the path to enlightenment and looking to improve the quality of his mind, he would understand how sexual contact and craving for sexual contact creates a discontent mind. Because with such a high sex drive, I'm sure there were times where he couldn't have sex. And he knew that that led to discontentedness. At the time, during those first 29 years, he wasn't thinking about that. He was just embroiled in craving anger and ignorance, just like everybody else. But once he observed those four observations and his mind went into this tailspin where he experienced discontentedness and his mind didn't have a reprieve, then when he charts off in his journey to attain enlightenment, that's where all those lessons that he accumulated with his profound memory would have came to be recalled later and ultimately helped him to discover what it was that was causing him discontentedness in this life and why his own mind was so discontent. And as he starts shedding those things and he stops having sex and he no longer has the craving for sex and he eliminates you know, lying and stealing and all the other things that he teaches as part of his path, he realized that as he slowly started to shed these things out of his life practice, his mind became more peaceful. It became more calm, more serene, more content, more joyful. And that's how he knew by shedding away all of these things that that's what led to his enlightenment in this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. So during those first 29 years, he would have been picking up things that ultimately he used later, but he wouldn't have known that those first 29 years. So those first 29 years, he didn't know he was destined to become a Buddha. He didn't know that he was going to embark on this journey to figure out how to solve the discontent mind. He was just living his life as a member of the royal family. And it wasn't until those four observations that his mind almost kind of short circuited. And I was like, whoa, what happened? And now his mind was so highly discontent, he had to solve it. You know, there's no reprieve from a person who's about to become a Buddha in that journey to enlightenment, their mind doesn't get a reprieve until they figure out piece by piece by piece what it is that's going to lead to enlightenment. And as they do, slowly but surely, their mind gradually moves into this enlightened mental state. And that's how they know they've attained it because their mind was so highly discontent for his life, but also those six years, his mind was highly discontent. And as he discovered more and more pieces of this path, that's where his mind started to get the reprieve from this discontentedness. Well, but in general, do you agree or do you suggest that one observe and reflect on uh, the discontentedness that the mind experiences? What I suggest is part of this whole path, and I teach in all the different chapters and all the different classes that I teach, is that you understand these teachings, which I call the natural laws of existence. When you understand these natural laws of existence, you receive guidance from a teacher, but then you independently verify the teachings yourself. You don't believe what I say. Don't ever believe what I say. Even this story. Don't believe anything about the Buddha's life story because it really doesn't matter, truthfully. What matters is the teachings. And when you learn the teachings and you independently verify them, you gain wisdom. And part of that wisdom is what is discontentedness? What causes discontentedness? What is the elimination of discontentedness? And what is the path that leads to the complete elimination of discontentedness. Then you learn the Eightfold Path and you learn all the other teachings that I share, which one of the things that I share is how to develop your life practice all the way through to training the mind to eliminate discontentedness. In addition to breathing mindfulness meditation to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, also practicing generosity to train the mind to let go and not be so selfish, 
There's another thing that I teach as part of this program that we covered a few weeks ago, which is any time the mind is discontent, if you've got breathing mindfulness meditation on board and you're training the mind to easily let go, then when you see that discontentedness arise, that's like a red light on the dashboard of your car telling you you still have craving desire attachment and you need to investigate that and figure out what are the craving desire attachments that led to that discontentedness, whether it was happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, any of those pleasant feelings, you've got to see the craving desire attachments that led to that, whether it's painful feelings, sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, there's craving desire attachment that's led to those painful feelings. Feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, things like boredom or loneliness or shyness, all of these discontent feelings and others are all caused by craving desire attachment. So when you see any of these feelings arise in the mind, you need to investigate that. And when you see the discontentedness arise, you apply right effort which is to eliminate the unwholesome qualities and arise wholesome qualities. So you've got to cut off the discontent feelings in the mind. That's why there's a whole comprehensive path here. There's no way to tell somebody in three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes or even in one class period how to attain enlightenment. It takes many years to really guide you with these books and audiobooks, videos, classes, personal guidance to help you gradually understand how to attain enlightenment. But anytime you see discontentedness arise, you should be cutting it off and letting it go. And that can be easier the more that you're practicing breathing mindfulness meditation, generosity, loving kindness meditation, practicing loving kindness, and gradually learning the teachings through these books and these classes to transform this ignorance or unknowing of true reality transforming that into wisdom because it's in the wisdom of the Buddhist teachings that will teach you how to train the mind to eliminate discontentedness. It's an entire path that you need many different components of your practice. And that's why you just gradually work on it step by step to build it up that, you know, maybe the first four or five, six weeks, you're just working on meditation and that's it. But then once you get consistent with that and you build that up, then you learn the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. There's many pieces that come together. And the more you learn it, the easier it is for you to actually do it. Because learning it intellectually isn't going to produce an enlightened mind. We learn the teachings intellectually, reflect on them internally, reflecting, observing in the world these teachings that are they're the truth. Then we practice moving these teachings into practice, which is where the real condition of the mind in your life gradually improve. So there's all these different steps involved, and it's a really comprehensive approach. But whenever you see discontentedness, cut it off and let it go. But there's a lot more that you have to do in order to get to this enlightened mental state. Well, so uh, uh, the way that the Buddha tried to use or train his body to uh, attain enlightenment wasn't successful. Does this mean that one cannot use uh, the body as a tool to train the mind? So the things that we can take away from that is that putting the physical body into painful situations isn't what leads to enlightenment. And this is why when I teach meditation, if people are sitting or in any other position and they feel pain, I suggest to them to shift their body or change positions because if you're being taught that the hip is in this deep pain and to kind of push through the pain or the knees in pain and push through the pain, this isn't the way to enlightenment. If we destroy the physical body, we're not going to be able to get to enlightenment. We have to take care of this physical body in order to train the mind. So anytime the physical body is in pain, that's the body sending a signal to the mind, hey, something wrong with your knee, something's wrong with the hip, you should address this. So that pain sensation of physical pain is helpful to the mind so that you know to shift the body. Even an enlightened being is still going to experience physical pain, 
they're going to experience it in a different way than the unenlightened mind. But they're still going to experience physical pain so that if they get close to a stove and they feel the heat, they know to make a decision to walk away from the stove. So the human body is going to experience pain. And this is why we say that you can attain enlightenment in this life. But then once this physical body dies, we call it final enlightenment. This is where the body and the mind separate. So you can transcend all mental and emotional pain as part of this path to enlightenment. But while you're in existence, you can't transcend physical pain. You're going to still feel the occasional physical pain, but you're going to experience it very differently. It's not until final enlightenment that once you've attained enlightenment in this life and then the physical body dies, that the body and the mind separate and now there's no longer even physical pain at that point. So that's why we call it final enlightenment. So this body is really just essentially carrying around the mind. The body is almost kind of like a vessel that's allowing this mind to stay in this life. I call the mind the boss and the body the employee because the body is going to follow whatever the mind says. The mind is the boss, the body is the employee. So we use the employee to get to the boss. So when we do meditation, we do seated or standing or lying or walking, we're using the body to access the mind. So that's why I teach in meditation to make the body comfortable, but not luxurious. Because if we make the body too luxurious, we're not going to be able to access the mind. The mind's going to turn off. It's going to go to sleep. It's going to become inattentive. So if you make the employee too luxurious, they're going to become lazy and they're not going to want to take you to go see the boss. But if you make them comfortable, but not luxurious, just make them comfortable. Now the employees will be willing to go take you to see the boss. So we use the physical body in order to get access to the mind. But these two things are completely separate and you should never put the body in physical pain because if you cause pain to the employees, are they going to want to take you to go see the boss? No, they're not going to want to take you to see the boss. All you're going to feel is pain, 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 pain. So you would like to make the body comfortable, not luxurious, comfortable, not painful, right? Because those are the two opposite sides, painful and luxurious. That's not the middle way. The middle way is comfortable. So you make the physical body comfortable in meditation and throughout your life. And then there you can then access the mind and you can then train the mind because you've got access to it through this employee. So for example, if the mind's really busy and overactive and the mind's really busy because it's in the unenlightened state, well, you use the body to do walking meditation. You walk and walk and walk and kind of take the body getting the body more and more comfortable so that then the mind will calm down, right? Or if uh, you need to sit and you're feeling some pain in your hip or your knee, then maybe you try lying meditation or you try walking meditation. Or if you're in lying meditation and you feel sleepy, then maybe you stand up and you go do walking meditation or standing meditation so that the body doesn't become too luxurious and the mind turns off. So you always would like to look for that middle way and bring the mind into the middle in meditation, but also in daily life as well, so that you're not disparaging the body and causing pain to it because you need this body in order to stay in this existence and train the mind. Yes. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Ali. She asks, I read that if we have not attained one of the four stages of Nibbana, we will be reborn to a lower realm of existence, hell, afflicted spirits, or animal realm. But I heard that some people practice for whole life and do not attain enlightenment. Does this mean one will be reborn in a lower realm if one doesn't attain enlightenment even when he is practicing uh, diligently? It all depends. There's many dependencies that determine where someone is reborn. If they attain the first, second, or third stage of enlightenment, 
the first and second stage of enlightenment, they're going to be reborn into the human realm. We know that for sure. If they're attain the third stage of enlightenment, we know that they're going to be reborn into the heavenly realm for sure. If they attain the fourth stage, which is actually enlightenment, then we know they're not going to be reborn. But what happens next is an undeclared teaching. If somebody's not attained any of those four stages of enlightenment, doesn't mean that they're automatically going to be reborn into a lower realm. You can actually still be reborn in the human realm or in the heavenly realm, having not attained one of these three stages, right? So it's not clear cut of, okay, I did this, so therefore I get that, or I didn't do this, so therefore I get that. It's not that clear cut. It's all based on the natural laws of existence. And in this case, it comes down to the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result. There's all kinds of things that the Buddha teaches that will lead to rebirth in hell. There's all kinds of things that he teaches that leads to rebirth in the animal realm. There's all kinds of things that he teaches that leads to rebirth in the afflicted spirits realm. There's things that he teaches that leads to rebirth in the heavenly realm. And there's things that he teaches that leads to rebirth in the human realm. But you wouldn't be able to discern that in this life. And nobody else would be able to discern it either. A Buddha can discern it. A Buddha would be able to say, oh, that being, they're going to be reborn in this place or that place. But other people wouldn't be able to discern it. Instead of thinking about where your potential next rebirth is instead what i would encourage you to do is focus on right now in the present moment learning and practicing and improving the condition of the mind so that you can get closer and closer to enlightenment if you get to enlightenment outstanding you'll know that as the condition of the mind is gradually improving but if you fall short of that for some reason your next rebirth will be a better and improved rebirth Even if it's back into the human realm, it will be an improved rebirth in a situation where it becomes easier for you to learn and practice these teachings and get to enlightenment on your next rebirth. So there's all this guidance that we can talk about, but it's not like a one for one. You can't say exactly what's going to happen. And this is one of the reasons why people who say they're not going to get enlightened in this life, they're going to help other people attain enlightenment. And they're going to come back in the next life and help other people. This isn't true either because you can't lead anyone else to enlightenment if you haven't attained enlightenment yourself. This is like trying to teach someone to drive a car, but you've never driven a car before. So you'd have to be able to get to enlightenment to help others get to enlightenment. But also, if someone says, I'm not going to get to enlightenment and be reborn so that I can help others, well, who's to say where they're going to be reborn? They might be reborn into a lower realm and those beings can't attain enlightenment in the lower realms. So there's a lot of teachings around this area, but I tend to be interested in focusing people on the core and central path so that they can get improvement to the condition of the mind and they can see that improvement for themselves as their mind is gradually improving and don't worry about rebirth in the future. Because if you do all the good work that you need to do in this life, in this present moment, there won't be any more rebirth. So you don't even have to think about that. Well, uh, no more questions, teachers, for now. Okay. So if that's the case, let me just share one last thing as part of our class and just to kind of finish out today's class is essentially it's important that you understand that this path to enlightenment, it took the Buddha six years to attain enlightenment. So it's going to take you a little while. Uh, It's going to take you some time. You know, if you've been on this path for six months and you've been studying with me, you've probably seen some good progress. But it's not a six-month thing. It's not a two-month thing. It's a few years. It's going to be a few years on this path. And if you've been studying the path to enlightenment for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and you're not seeing progress on the path, then I'm really pleased that you're starting to learn because I can help you make progress on this path. Because that's a long time to go without seeing real progress on the path. So 
it's wonderful that you're tuning in and you're learning if, if you've been studying for that long and you haven't really seen progress. So this path to enlightenment, it's going to take a while. This difficult human existence that we experience, sickness, aging, and death, once the mind is enlightened, it's no longer a difficult human existence. The mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. While living in the unenlightened mind is quite a struggle. It's not easy, right? It's quite a struggle. It's a difficult life. That life feels almost miserable. But once the mind moves into enlightenment, it's so utterly peaceful that it's like, whoa, I can actually do this. This is actually quite joyful. Wow, this is the way life's supposed to be. So no one ever said life was going to be easy, right? And your life hasn't been easy. That's the whole reason why you're learning and interested in discovering these teachings because life isn't easy. And nobody ever said life is going to be easy. But life isn't supposed to be tough either. We make it more tough because we don't understand these natural laws of existence in the unenlightened state. We don't understand what we don't understand. We walk around with this ignorance, with this confusion, with this unknowing of true reality, and life becomes a real struggle and really difficult. So it is a difficult human existence because we don't understand what we don't understand. Just like the natural law of gravity when we were children, and we fell and we hurt our elbow and we hit our head and we got our knees busted up. That was very difficult for us as a child because we didn't understand the natural law of gravity. But as we evolved, as we got more wisdom about this natural law, we became more and more comfortable because we understood this natural law. By the time we were 12, 14, 16, 18, we understood it. And now we can function in the world more peacefully because we have the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. Well, the same thing has been going on for countless lives that you haven't understood the natural laws of existence. So it makes sense that life has been a struggle. It's been difficult. It's a difficult human existence. But it's all just because that you've lacked the understanding. You've lacked the wisdom of these natural laws. And because of that, life has been tough in certain situations. It's been difficult and a struggle. But once you understand and you start to practice these teachings and you learn this wisdom, just like you learned the wisdom of the natural law of gravity, when you learn these natural laws of the Buddhist teachings, life becomes easier and easier and easier. So by learning Gautama Buddha's teachings, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to learn these teachings, but you can do it. You've got all the support and help you need right here with me. So learning is not easy and practicing these teachings sometimes is not easy. But in doing so, it's going to ensure that life is not tough. Because if you continue in the unenlightened state, struggling, not knowing these natural laws of existence, life can seem quite miserable. But as you learn, as you gain this wisdom, as the mind awakens and you see the discontentedness continually diminish and the mind becoming more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, this is where life becomes not tough based on your own decisions. So it's really wonderful that you guys are deciding to learn and practice these teachings because as you do, you'll start seeing for yourself what these natural laws of existence are and you'll take this very difficult human existence where sickness, aging, and death can be very detrimental to the mind and you can feel like you're struggling and you can improve that to life being not so tough. You'll still have challenges as an enlightened being. There'll still be challenges that come up, but you'll have the wisdom of exactly how to handle it. So it'll be no problem whatsoever because going around being angry, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, resentful, jealous, sad, angered, guilt, shame, bored, lonely. All of these discontent feelings are really taxing on the mind and really taxing on your life. And this is why at the end of the day, you can just feel so tired and so exhausted because carrying around this burden of craving, desire, attachment, it's quite burdensome to carry it around. But when you let all of this go, when you train the mind to eliminate this pollution in the mind, 
the mind becomes very light and very tranquil, very concentrated. The body becomes very light and you don't feel the burden of having to go through life carrying around this craving, desire, attachment because you've eliminated that and all the other pollution from the mind. So this is the path that ensures that life isn't going to be tough. But it's going to be a challenge. You're going to meet some challenges along this path. But when your mind is struggling the most on this path and you're having some real difficulties, that's when the mind's doing the most work. That's when it's learning the most. So if you learned for a couple of months and everything was going so wonderful as you first started out, and then you kind of get into these real rough spots and these really difficult spots with your life, well, that's where all the work's being done. That's where you're starting to learn things. That's where you're having experiences. That's where the wisdom starts coming in because now you're having to work your way through these challenges and these difficulties in life. And when you emerge on the other side of these difficulties, you will emerge with more wisdom so that those difficulties don't ever happen again because you'll understand why these difficult things were happening in your life. As you understand the Buddhist teachings, you will understand why these difficult experiences have been happening in your life and you'll make different decisions. You'll make better decisions with this wisdom of the Buddhist teachings that will lead to wholesome outcomes. It'll lead to better outcomes. So that's what this whole path is about is ultimately it's like upgrading your computer system to a new operating system. It's like upgrading the mind to a new operating system where rather than function on, on this old, archaic, unenlightened 1.0, you're gradually upgrading bit by bit by bit to the enlightened mind 9.0, where now you're using better wisdom, you're using more improved understanding of these natural laws of existence, and you'll start making wiser and wiser choices that will have better outcomes for you. So it's going to just require you to have dedication, commitment, and diligence to actively learning and practicing this path so that you can eliminate this difficult human existence and enjoy the rest of this life. And not only enjoy the rest of this life, but then no longer need to experience the cycle of rebirth. Because while the Buddha discovered the answers to the discontent mind and how to solve the discontent mind, that is the problem that every being is experiencing. But the real problem, the bigger problem that we're experiencing is the cycle of rebirth, continuing to come back over and over and over. This is why problems in our life continue over and over and over again. It keeps happening over and over and over again until we learn the wisdom of how to make better decisions so that no longer happens. So if you get angry at any one particular situation, that situation is going to keep happening over and over and over and over again until you figure out how to no longer experience anger as a result of that situation. So learning and practicing on this path will eliminate the discontent mind, but the bigger problem that you're solving is this whole cycle of rebirth. And once you do get to this enlightened mental state and you progress to that point where the mind's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, you will thank yourself over and over and over again. Thank goodness I stayed on that path. Thank goodness I kept learning. Thank goodness I kept meditating. So as you're in those struggles and you're having some difficulties on this path, reach out, post in the Facebook, send me a private message, ask questions in class, schedule personal guidance. And in that difficulty is where the real wisdom is being produced, right? For people who've been kicked around and beat up by the world, these are the people that tend to have more and more wisdom because you've learned through being kicked around and beat up and tossed about in the world, you've learned how to transcend that. So I would like to just thank you all for continuing to learn and practice and realize that you're on a path to escape all of this discontentedness and this whole cycle of rebirth. In our next class, we're going to be studying chapter 20, which is the evolution of our consciousness, animal to human. In this particular chapter, 
I'm going to now move from this difficult human existence that we've talked about and help you to understand how we've all evolved out of these other realms. And many of us are being reborn out of the animal realm into the human realm. And this is the instinctive animalistic behaviors that is part of the unenlightened mind. This is why the unenlightened mind functions the way that it does is because most of us are being reborn out of the animal world. So once you understand these animalistic behaviors, and that's what the unenlightened mind is experiencing, and then you can more clearly see this human mind of an enlightened being, then you can more readily move from this animalistic behaviors to this human enlightened mind. So when we talk about this next week, I'm going to help you see that evolution of how your mind has been experiencing countless animal rebirths. And now that you're in this human realm, you can evolve beyond that and experience becoming truly human and being able to function in the world with ease and with smoothness so that life is not so tough. So thank you all for all your questions and everything that you've done in order to continue to learn. Next Sunday, we'll be learning chapter 20. So feel free to read that before or after class or before and after. And then on Wednesday, we'll be doing loving kindness meditation together. So if you'd like to do loving kindness meditation, you're welcome to join us for that. So until a future class, we'll see you next time. Have a very lovely rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.